articulate preacher. He had begun serving as the people's priest in Zurich's great minster church beginning in 1519. Many of his supporters, both clerical and lay people, were in the audience that day. On the other side were representatives of the Catholic Bishop of Constance, who held spiritual oversight in Zurich. Johannes Fabri, the Vicar General of Constance, led the delegation, supported by other Catholic clergy in the area. Welcome to one and all. Herald, read our proclamation so that all may understand the reason for this gathering. I am Fritz von Anwil, Chamberlain of the Bishop of Constance, and one of his accredited representatives. 
your honors. The bishop is aware of the growing number of quarrels and dissensions regarding doctrines and sermons. He has sent us to listen to the causes of this dissension. We are to proceed with kindness and do the best we can to resolve matters leading to honor, peace, and harmony for the council and the clergy. Therefore, we shall listen gladly to any complaints, and for the sake of peace and harmony, we shall help to judge the dissension so that the clergy can remain in peace and friendship until our gracious bishop, together with his scholars and prelates, shall further discuss and consider these matters. Dear people of Christ, you know that God never abandons his people even when they fall into sin and error. He lifts them up with his mercy and does not abandon the work of his hands. The word of God has been dimmed by human ambition and teachings in our own time. People have been led astray by external spiritual behaviors founded upon human customs and laws. But we can only discover God's will from his true word in the holy scriptures and not from human laws and statutes. For the past five years I have preached in this city of Zurich nothing but the true, pure, clear word of God, the holy gospel, the joyous message of Christ, the holy scripture, and not by human aid but through the Holy Spirit. Yet all this did not help me. I am maligned. But I know that my sermons and doctrines are nothing else than the holy, true, pure gospel, which God told me through his spirit to speak. So I offer here to anyone who thinks that my sermons or teachings are unchristian or heretical to give the reasons and to answer kindly and without anger. Now let them speak in the name of God. Here I am. I am Johannes Fabri, Vicar General of Constance, and one of the bishop's accredited representatives. I have been speak not to oppose evangelical or apostolic doctrines, but to hear those who are said to speak or to have spoken against the doctrine of the Holy Gospel and to judge and resolve dissensions for the sake of peace. However, if anyone aims to oppose traditional customs and practices, then I refuse to participate. Such matters should only be settled by a general Christian council or assembly of all nations of bishops and other scholars. After all, if Zurich decided to change the common customs and praiseworthy practices of the past, what would those in Spain, France, or Italy say about it? As a Christian member and brother of Christ, I beg you to take care because all of this may result in greater harm. I advise you to drop any debate over long-standing papal ordinances. You should not debate or judge such matters. Besides, I understand there will be a meeting next year in Nuremberg to address these matters. They should also be brought for debate before the universities at Paris, Cologne, or Louvain. What about Erfurt? Or would Wittenberg do? They have universities there. No, 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 no. Luther is too near. Don't you know that all bad things come from the north? The fact is that university members have the ability to handle these topics, though I am not, of course, discrediting the knowledge of those here in attendance today. But to get back to my main point, I have been sent here for no other purpose than to listen, not to debate. People of God, the vicar general is trying to mislead you. He wants to exempt good old customs from the debate, but we hold that custom should yield to truth. And he says that these matters should only be handled by an international Christian assembly or a council of bishops. I say that here in this room is without a doubt a Christian assembly. For I hope that the majority of us here desire to know the truth, which Almighty God will not deny us if we desire it to His honor with right belief and right hearts. We also have many here with university training. As for the claim that other nations might not agree, this is what the big cheeses always say when they try to keep the pure and clear gospel from the common people. There is no doubt in my mind that if the pure truth of Christ was preached, 
unadulterated by human ordinances, not covered up with papal and imperial mandates, everyone in all nations would be in agreement. And don't hold your breath about a meeting in Nuremberg. Besides, what are we supposed to do in the meantime? Would you rob these thirsty souls of the truth? Let them hang in doubt? Frighten them by human ordinances? And let them live or die in the uncertainty as to the truth? Hence, dear friends, do not let the speech you just heard frighten you. With humble hearts, call upon God. He will not refuse you if you ask in true faith. And do not let yourselves be dissuaded or deceived in any way by smooth words. Thank you to both of you. Now, if anyone here present wants to speak to these issues or has anything to say on these matters, please step forward and speak. For the sake of Christian love and truth, I urge all who have spoken earnestly to me about my sermons to step forward and instruct me for the sake of God in the presence of so many pious and learned people. And if you don't, remember that I know who you are (laughs) and where you are sitting, and I will call out your name publicly. I would much rather have you stand up on your own account. Go ahead and make your case that I am a heretic. Listen to the silence. Where are all the big talkers that boast so loudly and bravely in the streets? Step forward. Here's the man. You talk a good talk of your wine. But here, no one says anything. Well, since no one else is standing up, I will, even though I'm not at all an expert debater. I'm a priest at Neftenbach, outside of Zurich. You know that His Grace the Bishop of Constance issued an ordinance this year ordering everyone to keep the traditional practices until and unless they were rescinded and changed by a general council. Master Zwingli has spoken and written against these practices in his articles. Since no one has stood to oppose him here, I think we should no longer keep the bishop's mandate, but should preach the word of God, pure, unadulterated by human additions. If we are to teach and preach according to the bishop's mandate, then Master Zwingli's words have no force. But... Since there is no one here present who dares to speak against his teachings, to show them untrue, I would like to have guidance as to what I should do about the bishop's mandate. I don't know the previous speaker, but I will respond on behalf of the bishop. He issued the mandate in question because there are truly many unfair, ungodly, unchristian opinions and errors at hand, which are very often preached and put before the people not only here, but elsewhere by unskilled preachers. These opinions and errors do not lead to Christian unity, but to its opposite, disobedience, disturbance, and discord, for they desire to estrange us from the good old inherited customs and usages passed down from our old pious Christian fathers many hundred years ago, including praying to the dear saints and to the mother of God. Dear people of God, our Lord surely caused the vicar to raise the topic of praying to the saints and the intercession of the saints and the mother of God. For this is a topic that appears in my articles and upon which I have preached and which troubles many simple folk as if I were speaking heresy. For I know and truly find in the divine scriptures that Jesus Christ alone can bless us for uh, who, as Paul says, alone is the justice of all who has expiated our sins, and he alone, our salvation and Savior, is the means of intercession between his heavenly Father and us humans who believe. So, I beg the vicar to show me the place and location, also the words of the scriptures, where it is written that one should pray to the saints as mediators, 
we have Bibles here in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Show me the chapters in which it is written. Then we will have it found and read so that we may see whether the Scripture says to pray to the saints as mediators. I see that the rules of the game are changing. I already said that I was not here to debate, but anyhow... Many hundreds of years ago, heretics of various kinds, including Montanists and Marcionites and others, asserted that praying to the dear saints and the Virgin Mary and their intercessions, as well as purgatory, were false human inventions. This matter was resolved a long time ago by the decrees of the popes and the bishops. But later schisms and sects have sprung up, including the followers of Wycliffe and Hus who put no faith in the intercessions of the saints and still less in purgatory. And still today there are those who undertake to drive us from old customs, which have endured and stood in honor these 700 years, planning to overturn and upset all things. On their account, the Holy Fathers and all our ancestors must have erred, and for 1,400 years Christianity must have been misled and ruled in error. An unchristian idea if I ever heard one. Just think how the heathen will rejoice to hear of our dissension. As for Master Zwingli's reference to the Bible in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, I say in the first place that it is a great gift of God to be able to understand the above-mentioned languages, and I don't boast that I possess it. I know nothing of Hebrew. I am not taught well in Greek. And I understand Latin only tolerably. Finally, I say, the evangelical and apostolic scripture is not found in the wise, brilliant, smooth, flowery words, but in the power of God. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, Thus, as before, I feel it is not enough to apply to bring forward scripture, but it is also important that one understand scripture correctly. Therefore, perhaps these matters should be entrusted to the universities, as I said before. Try being more concise. We simply want to know what scripture passages you use when upholding prayer to the saints and their intercession. Tell us the chapter and answer the question as asked in simple words, saying here or there it is written. Then we will see if it is so, And in case we are persuaded and convinced of it, we will gladly submit to instruction. There is no need of long speeches. We all know that some church councils made decisions that were then repealed or revoked by others. For councils have not always acted in the spirit of the Holy Ghost, but sometimes according to human will and judgment, which is, of course, forbidden by the divine scriptures. For the Holy Spirit does not say this today and something else tomorrow. But its ordinances and regulations must remain everlasting and changeless. I am accused of speaking evasively and not to the point. I have excused myself before for not being able to speak eloquently, and I have also listened to you, Master Ulrich. Be serious. You may be listening, but you are not answering. It is true that some councils called together for a particular reason have decided something that later perhaps not without cause, has been decided otherwise, but the general or universal council's decisions have not been changed and have been preserved like the gospel. For instance, priests have never been permitted to have wives since the councils determined that marriage of priests is detrimental to the churches and not for the good of the service of God. Marriage forbidden to priests is not found everywhere, as he suggests, but has been imposed by human beings contrary to a divine and just law. It is evident from Scripture in 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, 1 Corinthians 7, that marriage is not forbidden to priests by divine law, and that chastity is to be maintained not by means of resolutions, but with the help and the grace of God. And although this is known to everyone, Still, the Pope is able, by means of his ordinance, to demand chastity from each priest and that he be unmarried, contrary to divine law. And he can weigh down poor consciences corrupted by sin and shame. I say that I know of no greater scandal in Christendom than that marriage is forbidden to priests, yet they are allowed to commit fornication publicly as long as they give their money. Priests have not always been forbidden to marry. For instance... 
successive popes made and rescinded ordinances prohibiting marriage for subdeacons in Sicily. Since the time of Tertullian and the Council of Nicaea 1,200 years ago, priests have not had wives, nor have they been allowed to have a wife. But they've been allowed to have mistresses. <laughs> it is true that the subdeacons in Sicily, who had taken wives previously, contrary to the custom of the Roman churches, were permitted by Pope Gregory to keep them, but only on the condition that in the future no one would be consecrated who would not pledge himself to remain unmarried and chaste. Gracious counsel, I am a Franciscan monk. Last year I was a preacher in Lucerne where, according to my best knowledge and belief, I preached, as I hope and know, nothing except the word of God from the scriptures. And in these sermons I mentioned, like many others, the many useless customs of intercession and invoking of the saints and the mother of God and I taught in accordance with the content and teachings of the Holy Scriptures. I was accused of being a heretic, condemned and driven out of Lucerne. Now I pray, for God's sake, that Vicar Fabry show the Scripture passage defending prayer to the saints, and I will accept it with many thanks, and willingly allow myself to be taught in case I may have erred in my sermons, have not told the truth, or have misread or misunderstood the Scriptures. We know from the Old and New Testaments of God that our only comforter, redeemer, savior, and mediator with God is Jesus Christ, in whom and through whom alone we can obtain grace, help, and salvation. We cannot obtain this from any other being in heaven or on earth. I know that Jesus Christ alone is the comfort, redemption, and salvation of all and an intercessor and mediator between us and God, his heavenly Father. Nevertheless, one may perhaps reach the highest level by the way of the lower one. It seems to me that the dear saints and the Virgin Mary are not to be despised, since there are few who have not felt the intercession of the Virgin and the saints. I don't care what everyone says or believes. I have placed a ladder against heaven. I believe firmly in the intercession of the much-praised Queen of Heaven, the Mother of God, and another may believe or hold what he pleases. Dear Vicar, we are not debating how one should appeal to the saints or what your belief is. We only want you to show us your evidence in the gospel. This is what we've been asking you to do all along. My lords, you have appointed me here in Zurich as people's priest and pastor, perhaps unwisely, in order to proclaim to you the word of God, the gospel of Christ, which I shall try to do in accordance with my capabilities, insofar as the grace of God will assist me and the Holy Spirit help me. But surely, many human ordinances have been detained from long habit in the churches and have intermingled with the gospel so that the clergy frequently have preached and commanded their keeping equally with the gospel. Yet I now declare that I shall not obey such human ordinances, but shall present and teach from love the joyful and pure gospel. And whatever I can really prove from scriptures, regardless of human ordinances or old traditions, since such human ordinances have been recognized and proved by Master Zwingli's articles to be entirely opposed to the gospel and truth. And still, no one here has to say anything truthful or fundamentally against him. And so, although Vicar Fabry has pretended to prove and show by means of the gospel invocation and intercession of the saints, but he has not done so in spite of repeated requests. Therefore, dear vicar, I ask you to teach me if I have erred and report from the gospel showing where it is written that the saints are to be invoked by us or that they are intercessors. I would appreciate it and I will gladly show, allow myself to be taught by you. Shall I struggle against two opponents simultaneously? Even Hercules could not do that. Young man, I am not talking to you. But I am talking to you. I don't even know who you are. I 
would gladly be your friend if you want. That would be fine, for I am not here to make enemies. If you are my good friend, as you claim, then we can be like Socrates and Solon, who became good friends through debate. Then you have gained a friend. This discussion is veering off topic. <laughs> Vicar Fabri, we want to hear the quotation regarding the invocation and intercession of the saints, not so much useless talk and nonsense. It is the custom and practice of Christian churches and is kept thus by Christian folk, confirmed by the litany and the canon's missal, that we appeal to the Virgin to intercede for us. As the Mother of God herself says in the Gospel of St. Luke, all generations shall call me blessed. And her cousin Elizabeth addressed her in a friendly manner, saying, And how is this that the Mother of my Lord should come to me? We are not asking about the holiness and dignity of Mary, but about invocation and intercession. Well, since my words are held to be useless and foolish, I will sit down. I am Martin Blanche, Doctor of Theology from Tübingen. Dear counselors, much has been said here against the practices and ordinances of the Christian churches, which has been decreed by holy councils and fathers assembled in the name of the Holy Spirit. To oppose and to object to this is sacrilegious. For what has been decreed and resolved by the holy councils and fathers should be obeyed in the churches like the gospel. For the church assembled in council in the name of the Holy Spirit cannot err. So, no one should speak against their ordinances as Christ bears witness in the Holy Gospel when he says, he who hears you, hears me. And he who despises you, despises me. Christ said that to his disciples and to those who govern the Christian church in the place of the twelve apostles as bishop and pope. The good gentleman intervenes and urges much in favor of the ordinances and the practices of the church. But when he says that what has been decreed by councils and fathers is to be obeyed like the gospels, I say what is as true as the Gospels and what is in accordance with the divine spirit should be obeyed, but not what is decreed in accordance with human reason. When he declares that the church cannot err, I ask, what does he mean by church? Does he mean the Pope in Rome with his tyrannical power and the pomp of cardinals and bishops greater than that of all emperors and princes? Then I say that this church has often gone wrong and erred, as everyone knows, since it has destroyed the land and its inhabitants, burnt cities and ravaged the Christian people, butchering them for the sake of its earthly pomp. But there is another church which the popes do not wish to recognize. This one is no other than all right Christians, collected in the name of the Holy Spirit and by the will of God, having a firm belief and an unhesitating hope in God that church does not reign according to the flesh powerfully on earth, nor does it reign arbitrarily, but depends and rests up only upon the word and will of God. That church cannot err. My lords of the council, you see, there is no one who comes forward to bring anything more definite from the scriptures in response to Master Swingley's teaching. Please use your authority to protect evangelical doctrine. Dr. Sebastian, you should keep quiet and not speak like this. You know what you promised, my gracious master, the bishop. You should not bend from side to side like a reed in the wind. My lord counselors, I have honorably kept the promises I made to the bishop, but his people have not fulfilled what they promised to me. I am happy to say so in public. I'm Sebastian Meyer, a Franciscan and a preacher in Bern. Honorable counselors, I praise God for your published willingness to further the word of God. I pray that God will give you power and might, strength and comfort, so that you will not be frightened by any temporal power, whether pope, bishop, or emperor. Do not worry about your small numbers and limited authority. Remember that God has always used the smallest and weakest to spread his divine word and will in the world. 
Don't fear those who can injure the body. They cannot harm the soul. Please remain steadfast in the word of God. Thank you. Is there anyone else who still wishes to speak on these matters? The counselors are tired of sitting here. Call upon the Herald to read our decision. The Burgomaster and Council of the City of Zurich, having waited patiently. 
diligently but in vain for the promised meeting which our gracious Lord Bishop of Constance was to hold to address such matters as you have heard today, the Burgomaster and Council of the City of Zurich, in the name of God, and for the sake of peace and Christian unity, fixed this day to bring all parties together that are mutually accusing each other of being heretics. Master Ulrich Zwingli, canon and preacher of the great minister in the city of Zurich, has been blamed for his teaching. Yet no one has today arisen against him or attempted to overcome him by means of the scriptures. He called several times upon those who have accused him of being a heretic to step forward, but no one showed the least heresy in his doctrines. Therefore, upon due deliberation and consultation, the Burgomaster and Council of the City of Zurich have decided and resolved that Master Ulrich Zwingli continue, as before, to proclaim the Holy Gospel and the correct divine scriptures with the Spirit of God in accordance with his capabilities, so long and so frequently until something better is made known to him. Furthermore, all secular clergy, spiritual guides, and preachers in all areas shall undertake and preach nothing except what they can defend by the Gospels and other right divine scriptures. Furthermore, they shall in no way in the future slander, call each other heretic, or insult each other. Those who refuse to obey will be made to see that they have done wrong. God be praised and thanked whose divine word will reign in heaven and upon earth. And you, my lords of Zurich, the eternal God doubtlessly will also in other affairs lend strength and might so that you may in future advance and preach the truth of God the divine gospel in your country. Do not doubt that Almighty God will make it good and reward you in other matters. Amen.